Hi there, just as um, people are coming into the room, um, we just like to say hello. We're gonna give everyone a minute or two to arrive and settle in. Um, so just get yourselves comfortable. If you'd like to introduce yourselves and say where you're from, um, please do pop a note in the chat box and say hello. Just again to new people who are joining, hi. Um, welcome to our panel discussion on how and why to recruit younger trustees to your board. Uh, we're just gonna give everyone a few more minutes to join. Um, do say hello in the chat box so we know who's, who's here with us. Um, we're gonna run a little poll um, just in a minute, just to find out really who we've got in the room so our speakers know as well. Um, so just bear with us, we'll give a couple more minutes to, to let people join and then we'll get going. So it might be um, useful, I think, if we start by kicking off just with a little poll. Um, Meg, if you're OK to launch the poll, um, we'd just like to find out where you're from and what, what kind of position you're in. So it'd be great if you could just let us know um, so we know who we're speaking to. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much for everyone who is filling in the poll. We're seeing a beautiful mixture and representation of people here from CEOs, trustees, um, aspiring young trustees um, and current trustees. So lots of uh, different people in the room, um, which is really great to see. Um, before we're just going to wait, um, I think uh, another minute or so just uh, for some people to, to for more people to come in. But while we're waiting, it'll be great if you can just make a note of any reasons why not young trustees. Um, and also, uh, is there any blockers for you going to take your next step um, to, to recruit young trustees? Or if you do have any young trustees on your board, are there any barriers um, that you would like support and, and help with? Um, and just to let you know, um, this is your session to answer your questions that you have. If we are not able to get through all the questions today, we are gonna be producing a blog after this so we can signpost um, all the questions that have been asked and um, so that we can help you get the answers that you need. So this is your session. Please do um, make sure you get the, the most out of it. And we'll be starting very shortly. Great. So I think um, 
we will get going now. I think we've got a good number of people and hopefully anyone else can join and pick up. Um, so, hello. hi, um, welcome and thank you for joining today's panel discussion on why and how to recruit young trustees. My name is Philippa Randall and I'm a senior consultant at Charity People. We're recruitment and executive search um, experts. We connect brilliant people with nonprofits that are working hard to make the world a better place. Um, I've worked in the nonprofit sector for over 11 years now, first as a fundraiser and now as a talent search specialist. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a champion of the Young Trustee Movement, who are co-hosts today, um, and a supporter of the Campaign for Trustee Racial Diversity. I'm really excited that we can use the platform and influence that we've got at Charity People um, with uh, connections with some of the charity sector senior leaders um, and, and what that we can use that platform to highlight and facilitate positive change across the sector. Um, before I introduce my co-host Mita from the Young Trustees Movement, I just wanted to run through a couple of uh, logistics for today's session. So we've got just under an hour. Um, we'll be asking our panelists to introduce themselves um, and give a short insight into their experience of board diversity and young trustees. And then we'll be opening up for questions. As Mita said, um, this is all about you and what you get from the session. Um, so do feel free to share um, as much as you want and ask as much as you want. Um, we are going to be recording today's session to share with you afterwards um, and do feel free to get in touch with Mita or myself uh, after the session if you'd like to chat some more. Meg, if you could just put our contact details up on the screen, that would be great. So there's, that's how you can reach us. Um, we do offer all of our sessions free of charge um, and as a small favour we ask in return that you could get active on social media, um, share your thoughts, share your experience and any, any learning on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can tag us, um, Charity People is at Charity People and Young Trustees at Young Trustees. So we'd be really delighted if you can get active on our behalf. Um, now uh, over to Mita from Young Trustees to introduce her, herself um, and give us a little bit more background as to why this is such an important discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Philippa. So uh, my name is Mita. Um, I am a former Young Trustee and chair myself, and I currently sit on the board for an organisation called Health and Work. And the reason why the Young Trustees movement exists is because when one in 12 trustees are called John or David and less than 3% of trustees are under 30, it's no secret that board diversity is an issue. And that's a real problem because it stops us from being able to future proof decisions, reflect the interests of our communities, um, and uh, enable us to make better, more, more effective governance, really. Um, so we're really excited um, and grateful to have all of our speakers, panelists, and all of you here today to be part of the change um, to, to enable better governance. Um, so, so thank you for, for being here. Um, great, thanks, Mita. Um, now over to our fantastic panel. Thank you all so much for giving the time um, to join us today and to share your thoughts on um, board, charity board diversity, and in particular age diversity. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Neil, Neil Burkett, Chair of the Board at the NSPCC and Guardian Media, Media Group. Neil over, Neil, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Philippa, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm afraid I personally do not represent um, any form of diversity. Um, just look at me. Um, and I'm, uh, but my name is not John uh, or David. Um, I, uh, I've been associated with the NSPCC for the best part of 20 years, um, but all through my executive career and then my non-executive career, I've dipped in and out uh, of volunteering in some shape or form, I guess starting uh, as, a, as a cub and a scout and a um, venture and, and ultimately a queen scout. Um, and I, I feel, it's interesting, I'm, 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 I was on the board of trustees for the NSPCC for seven years and then I stepped down a few years ago just, just through rotation. Um, 
And then I came back after a couple of years break as initially chair elect and then chair. And I had, um, I had three sort of priorities really um, when I came back and points of focus rather than priorities. And one was to have greater focus in, in the charity. Another was to rebuild the great volunteer led uh, philosophy we had at the NSPCC. And the third, the most important one, I think, was having children and young people at the center of everything that we do. Um, we could hardly have that as a priority or a focus without doing something about our board diversity. So we did. That's really powerful. Thank you so, so much, Neil. Um, and over to you, Alice, can you tell us a little bit about you um, and, and who you are and where you're a trustee for? Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Alice Rath. I am a proud trustee for Crohn's and Colitis UK. I have been in post for a year now and I'm 24, which makes me a young trustee. I am also a young trustee champion. So working with other young people and organizations and giving them great reasons to bring young people on board. Um, I've also been a youth advocate within the healthcare and charity sector for 10 years now, which stemmed from my patient experience at Great Ormond Street, which got me involved with the charity sector and championing new voice in all areas possible. Brilliant. Thanks, Alice. Um, and Precious, could you give a little introduction to yourself as well, please? I certainly can. Hello, um, my name is Precious Atoli. I am the founder CEO of Social Practice ENT. Um, it's a not-for-profit accounting and consultancy social enterprise built on social justice principles. I also lead the Organisations Academy, where we support young women into trusteeship or into social entrepreneurship. And one of the programs that we run through the academy is called Beyond Suffrage. It's a training program for young women from black, Asian and minoritized ethnic backgrounds um, aged between 18 and 30. And we support them into trusteeship by providing them with training on things like um, charity governance, charity finance, inclusive governance, um, and thinking about um, stepping into their own leadership. Once they've completed their training, we then um, help to place them onto charity boards and they become ambassadors for the, um, for the training program. In addition to Beyond Suffrage, we've been building um, on the work that we've been doing um, and starting to think a bit more about lived experience trusteeship. Um, we work with um, some youth organisations um, with young people who sit on the sharp edge of um, socioeconomic um, disadvantage. Um, we have also have a programme that we've just launched with Women in Prison, um, supporting women with lived experience of the criminal justice system um, to become trustee. Um, so we really think about how we can effectively bring in more people um, who would normally be excluded from trusteeship into um, these roles. So I'm really excited to be taking part into this conversation. We're excited that you're all here. So a really exciting uh, panel. Welcome to you all um, and everyone who is here. Please do bring all of your questions uh, to this wonderful panel. Um, Neil, first up, we've got a couple of questions uh, for you from, from the um, audience. Um, and the first question is, why did uh, NSPCC decide to recruit young trustees? How, do, how did that happen and why was it a priority for you? Um, well, I think, I, as I said in my, in my introduction, um, it was something that, that when I returned um, as chair, um, that we, I remember we'd been talking about um, young people representation when I, was, uh, when I was a trustee and we clearly being a children's charity, um, focus on our beneficiaries. And we had you know, various mechanics to ensure that uh, we had the, the voice of children and young people um, throughout the charity. But, we felt as a board that um, we really could take it further. I, um, we sort of, well, it was, it, was my, it was my corny phrase, I can't pass it off to anybody, but um, we needed to have children and young people at making the decisions about the decisions we were going to make. Um, and so that the only way you can do that, the only way you can have um, children and young people decisions being appropriately made is to have children and young people making them. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we tried advisory boards and uh, we might talk a bit about that later because we're in the process of uh, reinvigorating that as well. But um, to, to, to several of us, it was really important um, 
that we had young people uh, around around the board table. Um, so we went through quite a, a, a lengthy process of, of, of getting them there. And I'm absolutely delighted that we now have two young trustees. That's really powerful. Thank you so much, Neil. And can you tell us a little bit about, you said it was quite a lengthy process. Um, how long was that process? Um, and could you tell us a little bit about what that recruitment journey looks like for NSPCC and if there were any kind of key learnings that came out of that? Sure, it was actually lengthy because we had so many applications. Um, so we, uh, we started back in June. Um, we went through the, our normal sort of trustee recruitment process. I think we advertised in The Guardian, um, obviously on our website. We used social media. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we threw our network, obviously, with the Young Trustees Movement. Um, also, we, we looked at some of the um, some good diverse websites, um, LGBT, um, Black, uh, Asian, minority, ethnic um, sites, um, wanted to cast our net as wide as we possibly could. Um, we had, I think it was 170 applications. Um, and uh, it was beyond an extraordinary list of individuals. Um, it just, right from the beginning, we knew what a, what a right move this was, um, that we had the opportunity to be blessed with um, infusing the board with this, uh, with this array of talent. Um, we, I, think, I think applications closed middle of July and we were going to do the interviews in August. We didn't get them done until September because we had to move our way through um, quite methodically how we were going to make decisions. We, we came down to a, a long list of circa 15 um, and then a short list of five, which we had a panel interview uh, with. Um, and, we, um, and we ended up uh, appointing two, uh, two young trustees. Uh, one was uh, 24 uh, and, and one 22. Um, I, uh, I then spoke to the three, uh, obviously the three trustees, the three applications that, that were uh, unsuccessful. Peter Wanless, our chief executive, um, he spoke to the uh, um, 10 or so applicants that were unsuccessful in getting to the shortlist. And so we've, we've sort of created a, a cadre of, uh, of really talented young people and, and some are going to follow their particular expertise and passion doing other things for us. So it's not just about um, infusing the board. Um, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a whole um, selection process and, a, and, and as a consequence, um, real eye-opener um, to uh, an obvious eye-opener. Thank you so much. And we've had a follow-up question um, from, from uh, one of the participants um, who said, was there any resistance that you got from, from the board and were there any stereotypes that were maybe overcome in the recruitment process when you were doing it? Yeah, all of that. Um, <laughs> um, look, I, I think sometimes um, boards, particularly boards of large organisations or large charities, they become a bit staid. Um, it's why we need to be proactive in, in ensuring we have real diversity. And so, yeah, questions of what, 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 what is, could they sit on? Um, how, could they, how could they contribute to this conversation? And, and, and we, sp we spoke about it and um, highlighted, you know, other young people that people might know and say, well, how would you like to have that person around the board table? Um, and so, yeah, there was, was the natural sort of blockages. Um, and I think it helps that uh, the nominations committee, which I chair, were absolutely unanimous and passionate about making this. Um, and so we have a, a board of trustees who've absolutely embraced um, uh, young people being appointed to the board. Um, we our first board meeting uh, where Shiana and Ife will join us is I think next week or back end of next week, um, week after maybe. Um, but we had a couple of co committee meetings. I think the real challenge now is is and Shiana our trustees, they they know more and they are no lesser trustee. 
party than anybody else around the table. Uh, and therefore, we need to we need to ensure that we we don't overplay the fact that they're under twenty five. Right, because they're just a part of the the trustee board, and that's the yeah. powerful part of it. Absolutely. Um, and fi final follow up question before we move on to another panelist um, is we've had a question this to say if you were one person on the trustee board who is really passionate about uh, getting more young trustees and more diversity on the board, but you're facing a lot of resistance from the rest of the board, what would be what would be your top tip if you had one to kind of convince the rest of the board to, to get on board? Um, you, you, it's like most. Um most things I think you need to you need to somehow or other work out a way to influence the chair um, or the nominations committee um, but the, look there is this is not brand new this is this is not rocket science um, having diversity on the board table include um, age um, you got to think about your stakeholders do you really have representation of all of your stakeholders i mean for us it was probably a little bit obvious i don't i don't know maybe it was easier because we're a children's charity but i'm not so sure about that um most charities in some shape or form have children in their stakeholder group, um and young people in their stakeholder group so um don't 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 give in keep on rattling on look at network and influence look at example where it's been um, hopefully as a, as a large charity we uh, be able to help in terms of influencing um give me a call happy to happy to have a chat it's a really uh, powerful statement and an offer thank you thank you neil and hopefully this inspires a lot more um young trustees and more diversity on boards um and over over to alice um what was your personal journey into becoming uh, a trustee. Yeah, hi. Um, so I became a trustee because I entered the working world at 18. I really loved working in the charity sector because I'd been a volunteer. I was patient at Great Ormond Street Hospital for 12 years, which meant I was on the youth forum when it was first set up, which then led me to the NHS youth forum. And while I was doing all these amazing things with charities, I was also working in the charity sector. I wanted to learn everything about the charity sector because uh, I knew this is where I wanted my career to thrive. Um, and I looked at trustee boards. This was something that I thought would be a really great opportunity for me with someone with lots of youth experience and lots of experience as a patient uh, in the healthcare sector. And I looked at these boards and realized that there wasn't a lot of diversity and I found it intimidating. Um, and I also made lots of assumptions when looking at the makeup of these boards and realized that it would probably be something that I would have to undertake later on in my career. Um, and then a few years later, I came across the Young Trustees Movement um, and I saw the work they were doing. And that was all it took really. I just needed to find their Twitter and it gave me the confidence I needed to apply because I knew that I had um, some really valuable experience that I could offer to a charity. Um, and then shortly after that, I applied to Cranes and Flyters UK. They were just looking for trustees and um, I don't think they were specifically looking for a young trustee, but they recognised the, the value that I get and um, I've been in post ever since. That's great. Thanks, Alice. And do you think, um, do you think young people want to be trustees? Obviously, you, your example is you wanted to learn everything about the charity sector and un understand it and get involved. Do you think other young people want to be trustees? Yes, definitely. And I think Neil touched on that earlier when he said that they, uh, the NSPCC received so many applications for their young trustee roles. Um, I think, first of all, that's an example of when we give young people the opportunity uh, we will see really great response. Um, if we also consider the, the younger generations, um, so we know that young people um, at the moment, they really want to take action and they want to make a change. And we're seeing that, um, that change in attitudes uh, with younger people. So they are more likely to take action. So there is no reason to think why they wouldn't want to be young trustees. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and what 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 have you learned through your journey? Do you think? 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I've been on a lot of youth forums and I'd also had the privilege of sitting on some other boards as well, uh, being a governor for Great Ormond Street Hospital. But uh, being a trustee really helped me build my confidence. Um, even though I was uh, still a professional quite early on in my career, I felt like I didn't um, necessarily lack, um, I didn't really have the skills that I needed to sit in the boardroom. Um, which was something that I learned in my role at Friends and Colitis UK. It gave me the confidence to speak out. Um, I've learned so much about charity governance. Um, it's been really, really great. But definitely, I would say that the confidence I have in myself now going forward has um, been the biggest impact. Yeah, brilliant. That, that's fabulous. Have you found your other um, board members supportive in that journey? Yeah, definitely. Um, we There was a few trustees that joined uh, alongside me as well. So there was four new trustees all at one point. Um, so we had a really great introduction process. We uh, found all about the charity and we got to meet the staff and hear about the amazing projects they're doing. Um, so that was a really great way of us finding more about more about the organisation. Um, and then we've see, received really great support. Um, when I joined the chair, Sue Cherry said that um, they didn't expect me to have all the experience, but it was something that they wanted to sort of guide me through. Uh, and they did that with their other trustees as well, because they made a point of recruiting people based on the value that they can add, not based on the previous experience they previously had. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Fabulous. Um, I love that, the idea of recruiting on potential rather than proved experience. Um, so um, this, I've got kind of a, a couple of questions that tie in together, really. Do, do, why do non-youth organisations need young trustees? Or do you think, what, what do you think young trustees bring to a board? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of, sort of non-youth organisations and why they should bring on young trustees, I think that stems from a broader question as sort of why do charity uh, boards need to have diversity? Young trustees is one element of board diversity. Uh, and as Mita touched on earlier, we know that there is an issue of diversity on trustee boards and this needs to change soon. So um, I think they stem some of the fact that young people are an asset, but we need to have board diversity um, as a whole. Um, and then the value young people can have especially is young people have different challenges today. Um, compared to um, other generations. So it's bringing that value. And what I would just say as a note is that young people, again, are still working professionals um, or students or uh, treasurers, digital trustees. And um, they may be young people, but they are not just a young person. They have so many other personal experiences and professional advice to offer as well. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Um, one, one last question before we move on to um, some questions for Precious. Uh, do young people need to be in the room, in the boardroom, um, to add diversity of perspective? Or can't we just get this from surveys or from separate youth boards? Mm, that's interesting. Um, from someone who's been on youth forums, I have seen a real change uh, take place from youth forums. Um, but as we see from the sector, we really want to create board diversity and having young people in the room can help shape charity structure uh, and how they lead to transformational change. We've also seen from this year that it is a really tough time for charities at the moment. So more than ever, we need diversity and perspective to ensure that charities can really thrive past um, the experience we've had this year. So they do need to be in the room because that's where decisions are being made. Um, but I would definitely recommend if there is potential to have advisory groups as an side to the boards, um, that can again add tremendous value, which Neil has touched upon that the NSPCC will bring in, in soon. Thank you for that. Um, and Precious, why, why is Beyond Suffrage needed and why did you decide to set it up in, in the first place? Um, I decided to set it up based on my own lived experience. 
So I qualified as an auditor at about the age of 23. Um, and I started going to client boardrooms and the first thing that I noticed was that um, most of the senior individuals were white, male and from middle class backgrounds. So there were very few people that looked like me. Um, I was often the only woman in the room, but always the only black woman. So it was something that played on my mind quite a bit. But what I found quite interesting was that it was the case also with values based organisations like charities. So I'd go to clients, um, charity clients and realise that it was exactly the same. Um, so that was the first thing that planted that seed in my mind uh, around trying to diversify boards. So Beyond Suffrage is born from my own impatience, I guess you could say, um, and desire to see better representation. Um, we launched around 2018 initially, and at that time it just so happened that there was research that was um, released by inclusive boards, where they looked at the top 500 charities and um, they found that 2.9% of trustees were women of colour, which is absolutely appalling. Um, and then if you think about the fact that young trustees make up just 3%, um, it just compounds. It means that young women of colour who are also trustees are probably the region of 0.1%. Um, so that's why we, we definitely need programmes like Beyond Suffrage, because they, they cast a light on that intersectional perspective. What often happens is that when charity boards think about diversifying, um, they think about diversity in silos. So it's often we need a person of colour to join the board, we need someone with lived experience, we need a young trustee, but rarely do you have that intersectional approach whereby um, we stop and we think about who's actually missing and how can we ensure that we don't replicate these systems of inequity. So um, we can safely say that there's some kind of structural inequality that has resulted in women of colour being underrepresented. So if we're not intentional when it comes to recruiting young trustees, we will effectively replicate the system. And um, yeah, those who sit at the edges will never get an opportunity to come in. So that's the rationale behind um, Beyond Suffrage and yeah, one of the main reasons why we set it up. Great, thank you. Um, and a follow-up question uh, from a member of uh, one of one, a person who's attending is how we found the reception of your program that target, targets a specific subset of young people, uh, in particular young black women, have many charity partners come forward? We had a really good reception, especially when we first launched. Um, we had, we managed to secure 50 charity partners for the 12 young people. But one of the main challenges that we faced was um, the young people were not always um, looking to join charity boards of our charity partners. So what we eventually did was we um, effectively gave power to the young people and created the opportunity for them to apply for any roles that they wanted to, um, to apply for. So that way um, there was power on both sides on the charity side in that they could invite young people to interview and then the young people side in that they could pick which charity boards they wanted to join. Um, so having said that, I'd say the, the reception has been quite good. I think a lot of boards are really starting to think about the issue of um, racial inequity in the charity sector as a whole. So there's a lot more buzz and a lot more conversation around it. And there is a lot of conversation around young trustees. So we've, um, for the most part, had a good reception um, around beyond suffrage. And what would be your biggest piece of advice to, to trustee boards who are looking to diversify their boards or make it welcoming to, to people who might be different from them? Um, in terms of diversifying the board, I would say um, just thinking strategically and being quite intentional. So thinking about where you're recruiting, um, which channels you're using to advertise, um, recruiting quite widely, um, making sure that the actual spec that you're writing up is welcoming. Um, little statements like um, we welcome people of colour can make the world of a difference. Um, so yes, being quite intentional in your recruitment practice and the channels that you use can really um, make the world of a difference. But also leveraging the, um, the networks that are available in the charity sector. There are a lot more networks that are specifically for people of colour in the charity sector. And there are a lot of young people who are thinking about trusteeship. So I took part in an event about three weeks ago um, that was specifically around trusteeship. And there were so many... Um, young people of colour who were looking um, to join charity boards. So the talent is out there. And I echo what Neil said, um, when we opened up Beyond Suffrage, we had um, over 120 applications for the twelve training positions. And going through them, there's so many talented um, young people out there who are looking to join boards. So it's just trying to find a way to match the charities that are looking for young people to join their boards and this um, talent that's out there 100%. So in terms of recruitment being intentional, but then in terms of 
building a welcoming culture and being quite honest and reflecting um, on your practices on the board, which can probably be the most challenging part, um, but really thinking about um, your strategy in terms of justice, equity, diversity and inclusion and what it's like for someone who's, um, who's from a different background to join that board. I always say the, the key is compassion. I'm just understanding that we all come from different backgrounds. Um, if you've got a board that's um, predominantly middle class and white, uh, bringing in a young person, particularly a young person of color from a working class background um, will require some kind of work and adjustment on your end to ensure that they're not the ones who are effectively doing all the work and the adjusting. Because if you don't change your board culture, what will happen is um, you bring someone who's different in and they have to assimilate. But the ideal is to actually create a culture where everyone can come in and bring their whole selves and make a contribution and feel valid and supported. So I'd say the number one thing is probably just a really basic soft skill, which is just being compassionate, um, having a conversation with the young person, seeing how you can support them, um, what training you can give them with, because that's probably one of the key things um, when people feel supported and trained, then they become quite confident. Mm, and I think that links to one of the other questions that was asked, which was, as a, somebody who is, trains aspiring young trustees, what's the one thing that enables them to thrive most on, a board, on the board? And I think you touched it there, a training. A lot of trustee board members don't have training. And so just um, making sure that basic thing happens is a great thing that enables uh, people people to thrive. Um, we've also had a, a couple of questions um, about, could you share some of the websites that you used um, to enable people to come on, uh, to, to recruit people onto your board and where you found that most effective. Um, again, we will share that. I think Neil mentioned a couple um, in, in, uh, in, in his beginning. If you, if you panelists wanted to type it into the chat and if other people wanted to type it into the chat, um, and then we will also share it um, in our follow-up blog later. We're now gonna move into the section of the Q&A where we were a bit more sporadic um, and we ask uh, questions to multiple members of, of the board um, of the board boards are just on my mind of the panel <laughs> <laughs> um but firstly is there any other like particular reflections from the panel that, uh, of what has been said so far that you're just like bursting to share before we move on to some of the the key questions next there doesn't have to be I, Neil. I think that that point that precious you just made about ensuring that the young person or somebody who is from a more diverse background the last thing you want to do is normalize the process um, and we all end up with a blancmange in the middle um, and I think it's so so important that fellow trustees think about the representation that's being made the diversity that is being represented and they listen and adapt their behavior um, and I, I think that's such an important point precious such an important point yeah, I think that was really beautifully said. And we found the biggest um, changes for but like the biggest uh, benefits of board, where boards have been like this, this having young trustees on our board has been really transformative is where, where they've said um, exactly that, where they've actually listened to what needs to be changed. And it's not only benefited that young trustee on the board, but has created transformation as a whole. Um, so for instance, the, the training piece, um, <laughs> or actually do board papers need to be 50 pages long? Can they be slightly shorter so everyone actually reads the board papers? Um, Philippa, what other questions do we have for panelists? So I think there's there's one that specifically again for Neil that le leads on from that in in the sense that have you adapted um, you know board governance can be really formal um, you know with the quarterly board meetings boardroom environment can be intimidating and it is often intimidating um, have you adapted what how have you changed um, the ways you work as a board um, to, to, to get this kind of inclusion and to make sure you're listening and, and the new um, trustees are feeling part of what you're doing? Oh dear, I, uh, you, may have, you may have noticed that um, I disappeared um, a little while ago. It was because I have actually lost my internet connection um, and I'm now paired into my iPhone. So ho hopefully, you went a bit fuzzy then. Hopefully my, uh, my con connection hangs in there. Um, it was a good thing we planned for this contingency. Well done. <laughs> um, so look, I, I think it's too soon. If I'm, if I'm absolutely honest, we've had a couple of committee meetings. Um, you know, we, we, 
I, I think it's important that you embrace um, diversity in totality within your charity and, 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 and clearly that is represented around the board table. So, you know, we're doing some, you know, some diversity awareness, some um, un unbiased uh, uh, sort of blockages and training that we, we think we all need. Um, and so hopefully as we move into our routine, um, we will we will adapt our normal working practices, um, and I think some of the things that you've mentioned we're starting to think about anyway. We 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 want to we want a board that that discusses and debates and and engages with what we are trying to do in terms of protecting children. We don't want a board who sits back there in the formal sense of suit and tie and listens to you know people presenting things, um, and so. It, to achieve that, it was important we change the board and we change the way the board meetings are run and we change the way the committees are run. Um, and we ensure that we have got, um, you know, diversity of thought and, and that'll, that'll take us time. I mean, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and, and talk about the first step we've made um, around the board table to make decisions about the decisions that we're making. Um, but it's, look, I have to be completely open and, and, and honest. I, you know, I'm hopeful that we ensure that we capitalize um, on having a couple of young people on the board. I mean, I, I, I will champion it. I think that's, uh, um, and, uh, and, and again, back to Precious' point, you, you've got to listen to what um, your new trustees are saying and, 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 and adapt accordingly. So, Fingers crossed, we will do all those things, um, but it's too soon to be able to say, oh, we've done this, or we've done this, or we've done this. And Sorry, Perlifer, where are you gonna go? No, 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 <laughs> you go me too, No, I think that comes back into a really powerful point is like, this is a complete journey and the boards that are gonna get the most out of this is the people who are treating this as a journey to enable the most innovation. Like a magical change is not gonna happen overnight. Um, powerful change happens slowly and, and thoughtfully. Um, to enable better uh, better governance for everyone, really. Um, this is an open question to all of the panellists. Uh, would the panellists like to comment on the experience of young trustees dealing with having to be patronised by other board members or experiencing age discrimination or other types of discrimination? Uh, yeah, I look, I, I, sorry, sorry. You, you, it's better coming for you, Alice, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that I've been fortunate to not uh, receive this kind of treatment. Um, however, I have sat on other boards where uh, young people haven't been uh, seen to have as much value, uh, maybe just due to having less experience. Um, I would just say that um, there's lots of great resources out there. We want to work with uh, trustees and uh, trustee chairs that want to change and that are willing to do this. Um, and that for any young trustees that feel like they are experiencing this, there are lots of great resources that they can find with the Young Trustees Movement to get the support that they need um, to go forward with that. Now I'll pass to you. I look, I, you, you're going to comment much better than, than I would. I think, I think it's, it's, it's important. I mean, the way that we sort of indirectly um, thought about this, again, this is at the beginning of the journey, as, as Maita has said, um, is when we, when we did the interviews, we were looking for one trustee, one young person. Um, and Tessie Ojo from uh, Diana Awards, we asked to join us um, on the panel to help us through the selection process. And, uh, and she said right at the beginning, I think you're making a mistake if you just recruit one person um, and, and that you are asking too much. Um, and we, we've got a very large board, it's too large. We're in the process of, of over the next few years, we're going to bring it back to a, a manageable number. Um, but it's sort of, whether it's this question or whether it's the support question or the training question or the change question, clearly two people are going to be better than one and will support each other. Um, and it makes it more normal um, 
so that you don't have a single representation of a particular expertise or geography or diversity or whatever you've actually got a blend of expertise so i think that's probably my uh, would be my my early tip in that uh, to that to that question um, but too soon to have any real experiences yeah i i, I agree with what you both said um, and i would add the intersectional um lens again actually because we've been carrying out some listening works listening to young trustees who are young women of color um, and their greatest challenges are not around youth, they are around race. Um, so we haven't had any who have complained about being patronised. Actually, they feel quite supported. The greatest challenge is around microaggressions. So where, for example, they feel like they're being corrected around their language in board meetings or getting their name wrong, little things like that. That's where the greatest challenge is. Um, but when it comes to youth, um, I have found that most charity boards are actually quite supportive. So it's probably thinking about um, yeah, that intersectional lens again. Yeah, I think so. And I think it comes back to one of my favourite quotes of um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have all of these things in place, but actually the culture on the board is such a huge, huge thing. Um, and knowing that the board might have, um, might be facing barriers. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was how do you create a culture to enable be behaviours and meetings to be in a space that is accessible? And if people do make mistakes, um, what kind of culture enables um, people to, to kind of thrive in that environment and learn from those mistakes? I would personally say a welcoming culture, and I know that sounds um, quite vague, but really thinking about um, your personal values as an individual and what you bring to the board. So sometimes we think about institutions as if they live. Um, there is a charity, but then the charity is comprised of the individual trustees. So if each trustee takes ownership for their journey around creating a welcoming culture, ultimately you'll have a trustee board that's moving in the same direction. Whereas if you have one trustee who's thinking about it and then maybe the rest, it's not really going to um, result in change. So I think first of all, thinking about your own training in your own journey, um, what can you do to ensure that um, you are helping to create that welcoming board culture? But then also realizing that you're not gonna get it right all the time. That's just the way it is. There will be some mistakes. Um, you have to forgive yourself, but then the most important thing is to constantly make progress and to be committed to the journey, to always creating a welcoming board culture. And then ultimately having conversations have conversations with people who have joined the board. If it's people of color and young people in the organization, speak to them. They know, they can tell you definitely whether your board or the organization is welcoming and then use that leverage, that feedback and leverage it to actually develop new strategies and approaches to um, creating a good board culture. That's, that's fabulous. Thanks, Precious. And I think sometimes we have to be a little bit brave in order to have those conversations because it does feel like you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to ask uncomfortable questions. But it's, it's, it's the only way to kind of move things forward and make change, I think. Um, one of the problems that I know a lot of charities are experiencing, and, and there's a question from Susan Appleyard here, um, is around kind of how do they access younger trustees? So there is this, there's, there's a desire to get younger trustees on board and there's young trustees who want to get on board, but how do we make those two meet? Um, apparently Susan has put, put adverts on Twitter, has tried to engage with younger people, but it's just not getting, young trustees to apply. Um, so what would the panel suggest around, around that? How can, how can they engage with younger people? Um, I would say to utilize uh, some really great networks. So for example, we have the Young Trustees Movement that um, have a great network of future young trustees. So reaching out to them and some other great ones as well. Um, a personal recommendation as well um, from being on lots of youth forums, I know that there are so many great young people that are willing to be trustees, I just don't think they know it yet. So uh, find out if there are youth forums for your charity's niche, whether it's healthcare, there's the NHS Youth Forum and the NHS Youth Forum alumni. Um, and there are lots of other youth forums for different areas such um, other than healthcare. So as they reach out to these as well um, and you'll be able to find some amazing young people. Brilliant, thanks. Does anyone have anything to add? 
No, agreed. Echo, just leverage those networks. There's so many networks for young people um, out there. It's just leveraging them, le leveraging them and then using them to recruit young people. And um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> get in touch with Mita afterwards. And, um, yeah. you know, there's hundreds of networks out there. So brilliant. Mita, did you want to add? Yeah, I was going to say we have a free checklist as well um, of things that you can go through just to check that your application is is inviting as well. Can can the young people see themselves in the application? If you've asking for 10 years of experience in X, some people reading your application are being like, oh, I don't think I can meet the the what is happening here. Whereas if you ask, for instance, are you have you been a school counsellor um, and etc. in some of those ways? And do you have experience of X? Um, and again, in your interview process, um, looking for potential as well like looking asking people for their ideas on something as opposed to what did you do in this particular uh, situation which leads on to a really nice question uh, by linda moore who says as a former head teacher i found school council vital uh, could this be built so that it becomes a natural progression to trusteeship i love this and yes my dream <laughs> is that every school there every area in the country has this um uh, have school councils that like feed into this so as a small organization if you're looking to recruit somewhere in a, a local area schools are such a great place to do that because the if you connect with the teachers they'll know like uh, people who might be interested in this and, and open up some of those conversations um over over to the panel uh, to talk about this question and also the the question of how do we build up the pipeline of trustee young tr trustees to become future trustees in, in the future and what is um the role of, of potentially larger organizations in doing that i could probably speak yeah, to the I pipeline um there are I think I've probably mentioned this quite a few times, there's so many um, young people out there who are thinking about becoming trustees, so we definitely have a good strong pipeline. I think the issue is around connecting the two, so we've already got a good pipeline, um, there's so many networks out there, um, networks that target different types of young people, including those from working class backgrounds, so it's just a case of thinking about how do we connect those um, networks to the charities that are looking for young people. Um, but the pipeline um, is definitely there. So that's probably one less thing to worry about. No, and I think I'd probably rather, because I, I, I agree, I don't think it is that difficult. I think Peter, if you, if you look, you will find. Um, but I also think it's important that you, in, you, you embed um, young people throughout your governance. So whether it's a young people advisory board or um, we, we're sort of creating a, a you know a young people's board for change um, and and link that directly into your board you therefore you've created your own internal um, uh, focus or, or, or pipeline I think that the, 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 the problem in only having your youth advisory board is it is advisory <laughs> um, and uh, um, which is sort of an aside, I know that's not related to the question, but I think if you, you, you need to work on all aspects, there's not a silver bullet here. Great, thanks Neil. Um, I think uh, we, we've slightly covered, we've probably got time for a couple more questions, I reckon. Um, we've, we, um, Ruth has asked, was Neil, did you use a standard application form and interview for your young trustee recruitment? And I think that's an interesting question because partly we want, you know, it's about making the process as open as possible and not off-putting the younger people. So can you tell us a little yeah. bit? Yeah, we, we had both. So we had some sort of, not quite a form to fill in, but it was, it was reasonably um, um, structured. But also we asked for free format. So certainly from my point of view, I got more from reading why somebody wanted to be a trustee of the NSPCC in, in their own you know, free way of expressing. Uh, I got more from that than I did somewhere from some of the structured, uh, the structured questions. Yeah. Brilliant, thanks. Um, and Alice, did you did you find that with your application for for cones and colitis, was it? Did you apply using a standard application process? Uh, with the same, it was uh, free format. So kind of referring it back to 
sort of if you're applying for a job um you had uh, an opportunity to write almost like a cover letter um what i would say though if there is an opportunity um it'd be amazing to see charities that uh, broaden this out so giving young people the opportunity to send in a video about themselves. If, you know, again, this makes things more accessible, more inclusive um, for maybe uh, a disabled young person who uh, isn't able to articulate, um, they are able to send in a video of themselves. And then that's a great opportunity. So just trying to sort of broaden uh, blue sky thinking to get more applications. And that might get people really excited about supporting your organization. What a, what a wonderful example of why you need a young trustee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for that. We've got quite a few questions, um, which we won't have time to answer all of them. But as I said at the beginning, for the questions that we didn't, well, we weren't able to get to, what we'll do is we'll make sure we answer it in the blog and signpost um, uh, lots of resources that might be helpful um, in the follow up to this conversation. Um, and before we kind of uh, close, um, it'd be really nice to hear to, to all the panelists, like how would you in one sentence summarize the power of young trustees? The great philosophical question. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll kick it off. I actually have one word rather than one sentence. It, obvious. It, it really is, it's just obvious. Love that. <laughs> Precious. Yeah, I would probably say think about your impact. Um, young people can definitely help to improve your impact as a board because they make up a good chunk of society. So just think about your impact. Uh, and I would just follow to say that uh, think about the future. Um, young people are the future. Um, so why should you not have them on the board? That's fabulous. That's amazing. I really like that. That's really um, three powerful words, obvious impact in the future. Um, and, and what a brilliant way to, to wrap up really um, uh, today's panel session. I think it's it's been absolutely fabulous. Um, to the three of you, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your experience and your thought has been uh, your thoughts been really really invaluable. Um, I think um, I'm sure as as Mita said, I'm sure there's going to be lots more questions and people will want to ask more afterwards. So please do keep in touch, um, reach out to either Mita or myself um, to carry on the conversation. Um, we're really keen to kind of make enable change to happen at board level so anything we can do to help um we would love to um so yeah so thank you to our wonderful panel um for coming today for giving your time and sharing your experience and expertise thank you to Mita um from the young trustees movement for making all of this happen really exciting conversation um and really delighted to to have um hosted this today um and thank you everyone to all of our audience for for coming um, today and for joining us. Um, I think, you know, from a, for a long time, trustees have been recruited through personal friendships um, and word of mouth. There is that culture that, that has been embedded in kind of the, the, at the trustee level. Um, and I think it's really exciting that more and more charities are looking to have a more open and transparent recruitment process for new board members um, and making these, these positions accessible to a wide range of people from diverse backgrounds is, can only help change the sector for the better. So it's, you know, really positive, really exciting. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, it's, no. <laughs> you know, by, by championing diversity and inclusion, we counter what is the kind of real threat of groupthink um, and we become as a whole more creative, more innovative and better at solving problems. So, um, you know, really excited to be part of that. 
Um, yeah, thank, and thank you, Philippa and, and charity people. Philippa, this came out of um, a, a training session, a free training session, which you are all welcome to come to, uh, which walks you through how can you get to the root causes of any barriers that might come when you're looking to diversify your board. It's one hour. I'd love for you all to come and be there. <laughs> We're running some sessions in January. Um, but ag again, thank you for everyone for, for coming. And just remember that this is a journey. It's not a perfect tick box. It's a muscle. The more you work at it, the better you are going to get at it um, and and also just when we create better more inclusive boards it's just good for governance as a whole and um, so I would like to thank you everyone for coming charity people all the panelists and all of you amazing people um, who have come today because th this movement is made up of all of you um, who are making change and um, so I'm really excited to see what is going to happen in a year's time I've just put in the chat or I'm about to put into the chat um, a link for you all to to come to our one hour free training um, but thank you so much um, everyone um, and uh, we'll, we'll end here <laughs> because we know that timing is important for everyone um, and we'll make sure that we answer all of your questions um, in our follow-up blog.